you a fan of this podcast? Do you wish there was even more juicy content for you to sink your ears into? Well, there is. You can become a premium member of this podcast for $5.99 a month and get full access to an archive of over 50 bonus episodes. Additionally, we release a bonus episode every single month. That's a ton of extra content, including my personal interior design diaries, extra tips, my talking about trends, and so much more. Additionally, you'll be keeping us on the airwaves each and every week because your premium membership money goes directly back to making this podcast amazing. Check us out at affordableinteriordesign.com, click on podcast to learn more and to become a premium member today. Hello, this is not Betsy. This is Catherine, Betsy's producer. Betsy's going to be taking a little time off, just a few weeks, and she will be back with new episodes for you. So for now, please enjoy this best of episode. You don't need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look. Be your own interior designer with big design, small budget. Here's your host, Betsy Helmuth. Happy March. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys took advantage of those late winter furniture sales. And now you've gotten all your pieces. You're ready to put them in place. You're ready to start your spring cleaning to make room for those new pieces. And you need some inspiration. That's where I come in. I am here to answer your questions, to dig into my mailbag, and also dig into my brain to find the answers to the dilemmas that have been bothering you. If you have questions about your designs, send them to Betsy at AffordableInteriorDesign.com. Once again, Betsy at AffordableInteriorDesign.com. All right. I have some questions that have come in and I can't wait to share them with you. So without further ado, let's start with Kristen's. Kristen writes, Hi, Betsy. I read your book about a year ago and I really enjoy your podcast. I've used your tips to curate a cozy modern living room that my husband and I love. We are having a baby this summer, and I need some advice on repainting the baby's room. We own a Craftsman bungalow that was built in 1904. The baby's room is 12 feet by 13 feet with 10-foot ceilings. There is also a pair of side-by-side south-facing windows that are together approximately 6 feet by 6 feet. The previous owner painted all the walls and the trim an ombre teal blue with a mountain mural. It would have been perfect for a boy's room, but we're having a girl. We want to paint the room in a neutral, in the cream to white range. Do you have suggestions for a primer? Also, what white color of paint from the book would you recommend for the neutral color? I want to make sure the undertones won't clash with any decor our little girl wants in the coming years. All right, so let me start with that because I know you have another question coming up. So first things first, most primers these days do not, I'm sorry, most paint, Okay, let me start again. First things first, most paints these days do not actually take a primer. Most paints have a primer built in. So with that saturated color that's underneath, you'll just do several more coats, like maybe instead of one or two coats, you might need two or three coats of this new white paint color to cover, but you really shouldn't need a separate primer. I personally choose Benjamin Moore. You guys know that for the most part, but today I had a call from a podcast fan who was booking a virtual makeover, and she had a question for me about why I choose Benjamin Moore. Why can't she take the Benjamin Moore code and go to Lowe's and get Valspar or go to Home Depot and get Bear? And the reason is because, you know, you only want to paint once every five to 10 years. And so you really want to pick a paint that is good quality. You really want to pick a paint that's durable, that you can scrub if it gets smudged, that will actually cover those darker color paints underneath because it does have a really nice primer built in. And I just feel that that quality is there with Benjamin Moore. I have questions about the quality of other brands, and I think it's really worth it with something like paint that may not see 
seem very expensive per gallon, but when you add in the time that it takes, potentially the labor costs, it really does get pretty pricey and it's not something that you want to do again when your paint starts looking dingy. So just go for the good stuff and stick with Benjamin Moore. Now, let me get to the next part of your question, which was the color. I'm fine with you going with a white or a white-ish neutral. It sounds like you're leaning towards the cream tones rather than the gray tones, which have previously been very popular for nurseries. In terms of a creamy white, I do love Benjamin Moore's Swiss Coffee. I also think that you would love China White. And lambskin is a really beautiful color that's a little bit more saturated. It reads much more cream than white, but you may find you want that warmth in this room. If you were thinking that maybe grayish could be chic because you know I love my grayish, you might want to explore classic gray or even pale oak. Let me get to your next question. Your next question is, since the trim is already painted to blend in with the mural, we're considering painting the walls and trim the same color. We're eventually going to remodel the room and we don't want to spend too much time stripping the paint off the trim right now. Do you have any recommendations on this? We are keeping the existing medium teal low profile carpet. Thanks so much, Kristen. All right, Kristen. Of course I have opinions on this. No, no, no. I do not want you painting the trim color the same as the wall color. That makes it look like a cheap rental. It makes it look like, you know, the super came in and took his big five gallon jug of paint and just took that roller and went all over the room with no consideration. It does not look chic unless... And I do have this one little caveat because somebody's going to write me. Unless it's like an ultra modern converted loft where everything is stark white. In that case, I'm not completely opposed to white trim as well as stark white walls. And having them be the same tone of white is perfectly fine by me. In your case, I would like that contrast. I would like you to consider using decorators white for the trim, using simply white for the trim, or even whitest white to really get that stark contrast because your wall is such a light color that not any white will get it done. You need that pure bright white to look different than the color you're painting the walls. So Kristen, I hope that helped and I hope you will send after pictures of your lovely nursery. My next question comes from Kelly. Kelly writes, Betsy, I love your podcast. We are buying a bungalow that needs quite a bit of updating on the inside. On the outside, although the roof and siding are new, the front door is not facing the street. It's odd and the asymmetry bothers me. Also, it's not good feng shui. Am I right? Keeping the door gives us a bit of an entry. If we move the door next to the window, then the door opens directly into the living room and we're going to lose some valuable space. So I'm thinking of keeping the door. Aside from the paint, what do you think would improve our home's look? I'm superstitious, so I really want good energy in our home. Thanks so much, Kelly. Well, Kelly, I am going to share something with you. When I got your question, I must admit, I've never really thought about it. And I am not a certified practitioner in feng shui. I'm a dabbler. I love to read about feng shui. I love to use my bagua map. I have lots of books, but I don't have a true certification in feng shui. I'm going to speak to you as an amateur who was so intrigued by your question that I went online and did some research on this very topic because I will share with you that my door on my house does not face the street. I have a very similar situation to your pictures where when you look at the front of my house from the street, you don't even see a door. You wouldn't know that it's on the left-hand side, sort of in this colonnade. It appears to be flipped the wrong way in my estimation. In fact, my home is very cute on the inside, but she is not a looker on the outside. And I'm doing what I can with landscaping. I'm considering painting the stucco. I'm even thinking about adding shutters just to give her some flavor. But I realized after receiving your note that the reason my home doesn't have any flavor is because you can't see that front door. So not only does it look a little strange that it's not facing the street, but 
It also doesn't have that beautiful detail of a pop of color with the door. Or in my case, my godmother made us a beautiful stained glass piece that we put in the front door and nobody really sees it unless they're delivering our mail or unless they're our friends directly coming in to hang. Our front door is somewhat of an afterthought. So I went online to find out if this really is bad feng shui. And I must say, I couldn't find a lot about the front door not facing the street being auspicious. Of course, the direction that it faces, the ordinal direction, north, south, east, west, does have an impact. But there are other things that impact it more. For instance, you want to have an unobstructed entry. So you want to make sure that it's very easy to walk up to your front door and that you're able to fully open your front door and your screen door without hitting anything. The other thing that you want to make sure of, according to thespruce.com, feng shui tips for a strong front door, you want to make sure that the paint isn't chipped. You want to make sure that the door is not squeaky, that it's not rusting, that you have it in really nice condition. You don't want to have out-of-season decor, like an old wreath on there when it's summertime. You want to make sure that you put a lot of energy and love into your front door area so that way it attracts more good energy and wealth. Now, the other thing that you could consider is painting this front door. According to thespruce.com, they say if you have an east or southeast facing door, choose a color in harmony with wood or the wood element. If you have a south-facing front door like I do, you want to choose a color in harmony with the fire element. And my door happens to be brick red, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. If you have a southwest or northeast-facing door, you want to choose a color in harmony with an earth element. So we're thinking browns or greens. And then those west or northwest-facing doors, choose a color in harmony with metal. So maybe a variation of silvers or grays or even something that's akin to brass or copper. And then for that north facing door, you want to choose a color that's in harmony with water. So we're talking about those blues or maybe a silvery gray. Now, the other thing you want to think about is you want to make sure that you're really loving your entryway and foyer because that's setting the stage for both you coming and going. Let me see what else they say here. You don't want any sharp or pointy objects directed towards the door. These are known as poison arrows and bring in negative energy. You would ideally want a front door that's aligned with the back door so that you could come and go quickly. And you absolutely do not want a mirror facing the front door because when you come in from the outside, that mirror, if it's directly facing the front door, will take all the good energy that you bring in and bounce it right back out. So this is a tip that I really take to heart. And I have an entryway, but of course I love a mirror to check myself when I leave to make sure I don't have breakfast in my teeth. And so it is perpendicular to the front door. So it's not reflective reflecting the front door, but it's right there in the entry for practicality's sake. So those are a few tips. And Kelly, thank you for getting me thinking about my front door because um, after bringing in my Christmas tree, that paint got a little scratched and it sounds like it's time to, um, to spruce that up a little bit. And now it's time for a quick commercial break. Do you love this podcast? Do you wish you could learn even more? Well, we have an online class bundle. Our online class bundle is comprised of three online classes, Beautifying Your Home for Less, Styling Your Home, and The Fundamentals of Feng Shui. Each one of those three classes is between 30 and 45 minutes long and chock filled with visuals and tips, things that will help you to style your own space or help out with other spaces. Additionally, with the pack of three classes, you get an autographed copy of my book, Affordable Interior Design. You get all of that for only $99. Once again, that's the three online classes as well as the book for only $99. You just go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to buy your bundle today. 
And if one of those classes sounded intriguing, but maybe you already have my book or some of the other topics are not of interest, you can buy the classes individually at that site as well. Each class is $40. So head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash classes to get your bundle or your online class today. All right. Now I have a question that comes from Kara. Kara writes, Betsy, this is a possible question for your Facebook Live or a podcast. Do you have a formula for styling kitchen counters? For example, do you make a little vignette every 10 feet to include a kitchen towel, a tray, a bottle of olive oil? I'm just making up that idea, but I would love a formula if you have one. Thank you for your podcast and book. You teach so well, and I'm looking forward to more. Kara, I think you've heard me say whether it be on my Facebook Lives or on my podcast, that I am a designer who believes in practical over pretty. If you are a person who has 10 or more feet of open counter space, well, you must have a very big kitchen and or you must not cook very much and or wow. This is not a problem that I have, nor is it a problem that many of my clients have because there are so many different appliances that tend to live on top of our countertop, whether it be, um, you know, the toaster, the coffee maker, the microwave, a pot of utensils near the stove. These different kinds of things can serve as visual decor. You just want to think about them when you're selecting them. For instance, I splurged and got the stainless steel microwave instead of the black or white version. When I was thinking about my utensil pot that's going to live next to the stove, I made sure to pick one that coordinates with the backsplash tile in my kitchen, which happens to be a light blue arabesque shape. Um, the other thing I think about is just, of course, selecting the toaster so that it coordinates. And I do like to have a plant. In my case, I like a lucky feng shui plant in the kitchen because the kitchen is an area with food and with abundance. So by putting bamboo there, it will enhance your wealth. The same as if you put it in a dining room, anywhere where you're serving meals, where you have an abundance of food, that's where you can bring in good feng shui by having that leafy green plant and maybe even by taping a coin underneath the planter to bring in even more money your way. But I rarely think about styling a countertop unless I'm doing a photo shoot for my book or for the before and afters on Affordable Interior Designs website. Normally, I think it just looks cluttery. I think the items tend to get greasy if you're using the stove quite a bit. So decorative items for me just do not belong and they get in my way. Personally, I think the only other decorative item I might condone and that I actually use is a cookbook stand because I exclusively get box meals. Thank you so much, Marley Spoon. And they have these cardboard recipe cards. And in order to make the recipe, I love having it propped up so I don't have to hold it with one hand and stir with the other. But these kind of trays, these kind of decorative towels, I just can't get behind that unless they truly are functional, hanging off the handle of my refrigerator or the handle of my oven. Kara, I wish I had I wish I had more styling tips for you, but I just I can't support this. Um, but it looks beautiful in magazines, it looks beautiful on TV. It's just not practical for real life. Certainly prove me wrong. Certainly show me that you have 40 exposed feet of countertop, and I will come up with something for you. Because as you can see in my before and afters in my book, I styled countertops. Those just weren't countertops we were cooking on anytime soon. All right, I'm going to get to my next question, which comes from Simone. Simone writes, Betsy, thank you for replying to my last email. I can't wait to hear all your responses in upcoming podcasts. I have two more questions for you about my master bedroom. You mentioned that you always use white sheets to dress a bed. Why is that? I normally have white sheets in the summer and darker, cozier colors in the cooler months. I would hate to have a huge design taboo six months of every year. Here's what I say about that, Simone. 
if you are going for a high-end look, if you want something luxurious, well, you're going to pick crisp white sheets. There's nothing more luxurious, clean, and fresh feeling than a white sheet set. Plus, it's very affordable. It's going to coordinate with any style decor you have. It's going to look great with your bed. It's timeless. And so many of my clients say, Betsy, I want that hotel feel. And if you check out your local hotel, that dream motel you've been thinking of on vacation or just the motel down the road, you are going to see that they all use crisp white sheets. That being said, I have an assortment of colored sheets. I have only one set of white sheets and my other sheets have patterns and shapes, but it does get a little bit annoying, I must say. When you mix and match, when some of the pillowcases are clean, but not all the pillowcases are clean. So in hindsight, if I was going to get pattern sheets again, I would get two sets of each pattern for each bed. The other thing is it just doesn't look completely classy, but it is a lot more fun. And you know, as a designer, I love to mix and match patterns. And the key with mixing and matching patterns is that the pattern on your sheet set should be of a different scale or a different size than the pattern on your duvet. And of course, the pattern on your duvet should be of a different scale or size than the pattern on your rug. However, they all need to work together using the same color palette. And that can be a very tricky mix, especially when you're adding in accent pillows and pattern drapes. It starts to get a little frenetic, or you need to have a true designer eye to make it work. It just gets complicated. Keep it classy, keep it with white sheets, unless uh, unless you need a little confusion in your life. Your next question is also about your master bedroom. You write, Betsy, my bedroom has a depression in the wall that should probably fit a bed and a nightstand or two, but my California king fits into the depression perfectly. But now I have no space for a nightstand. What would you recommend in lieu of a nightstand? What I would recommend in lieu of a nightstand is potentially a storage headboard. For me, they do feel a little bit dormtastic. They do remind me of being at my grandma's house, or I don't know why they remind me of summer camp. I went to many a summer camp, and I never had a storage headboard, but it just reminds me of kind of a juvenile or not very designerly aesthetic. However, they can be quite practical. A storage headboard is one that's almost like a bookcase behind your bed. It has shelves or it has drawers or in my grandma's case, it had like sliding doors so that one half could be exposed for your water and your book and the other half could be concealed for your alarm clock or your Kleenex or whatever, right? Uh, I do see that it's in this depression and While it fits perfectly, it is unusual to not have nightstands. It's unusual to not be able to accommodate them in any way because you really have walls on either side. I would toy with the idea of putting the bed on a different wall, a wall where you do have nightstands because having a luxurious, beautiful, grand, king-size bed with no nightstands takes that luxury and throws it right out the proverbial window. It looks compromised cramped, uncomfortable, and where am I putting my cell phone? These are my thoughts, Simone. I hope that's helped. Guys, keep your questions coming. The mailbag is starting to get a little light. So send those emails to Betsy at affordableinteriordesign.com and I will be back with you next week. Bye. You've asked for it and we have answered the call. For years, you've been saying, Betsy, you're talking about all these great design concepts, but we can't visualize them. You're describing the picture that the listener sent in of their problem, and we wish we could see that picture too. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I do my best to describe them, but there's nothing like seeing it for yourself. And that's why Affordable Interior Design, the podcast, now has a YouTube channel. Not only do we have a YouTube channel where you could see recordings and clips of these podcast episodes, we also have an Instagram, a Facebook, and so many other exciting things. You should check it out. Head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash links. Once again, affordableinteriordesign.com slash L-I-N-K-S. 
links. And when you go there, you will see links to our YouTube page, our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and more. Please check it out. Follow and subscribe so you can see everything I'm talking about. A big thank you to our amazing producer, Catherine Heller, to Aton and the MBCR House Band, and to Affordable Interior Design, the sponsor of this podcast and the premier place to get an amazing look on a budget. Check out affordableinteriordesign.com. If you guys love the show, the very best way to support us is by spreading the word. Tell your friends or write us an awesome review on iTunes. So until next week, guys, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.